All right. Well, good evening, everybody. And uh, thank you so much for, for joining us on this Tuesday evening. I apologize if you had originally registered for the event um, back at the end of June. You had a little bit of technical difficulties, et cetera. So I'm so glad that you were able to make it out this evening. Um, so yes, my name is Robin Devine, and I am the owner of the Lymph Balance Centers here in the city of Calgary. Um, I've been a massage therapist now for about 23 years and a practicing lymphatic therapist um, for 18 of those. Um, out of all that, I've also had the pleasure of doing about nine years of lymphedema work, so being a certified lymphedema therapist. And that all became about because there just wasn't enough of us and there weren't that many people that I knew who were lymphatic therapists. And um, there was always phone calls of people who needed expertise who needed not only the manual therapy, but also needed, um, you know, guidance on compression garments and wrappings and um, pneumatic compression pumps and everything like that. So when I started having to turn down lots and lots of clients, I decided to open my centers and I'm a very, very proud um, business owner, but love working with my teams and I feel kind of lucky that I've been able to handpick the lymphatic and lymphedema therapists that I have on our staff. So um, I also teach for the Chickley Health Institute, which is run out of the States. I teach lymphatic drainage as well as their lymphedema therapy certification program around the world. And uh, not only does it get me some nice traveling around the world to different locations, but also makes it so blatantly obvious that there's not enough lymphedema care anywhere else in the world either. And if anything, we're actually quite lucky, lucky with the amount of therapists and services available here. So when I travel to Malaysia or Thailand, it is a lot more sparse and uh, harder to find um, therapists and resources. So that's one of my goals is to try and make sure that Canadians across the whole country are able to gain access to resources that they need, um, but also um, starting to spread the word around the world. So um, this past year, I also decided that there wasn't enough events and opportunities for lymphatic therapists um, and for patients um, here in Western Canada. So I started LymphiCon, which is a health conference um, for all things lymphatic. So um, just a little bit about me, aside from being a mother of three and uh, a very proud born and raised Calgarian, um, that's a little bit about me. So, so the topic that I'm going to talk about tonight are what are the differences between lipedema and lymphedema? It's a very common um, confusion. We see a lot of patients coming in saying, no, no, I have lymphedema. And I look at them and I look at their legs and I go, no, no, that definitely looks more like lipedema or the opposite. So it's always kind of good to be able to see and um, just sort of look at how we differentiate them um, in a clinic diagnostically. Now, as a certified lymphedema therapist, I have access to basically my patient's health history forms. So I get to know a lot about their history, when things started, how things evolved. I get to know a lot about injuries, incidents, um, et cetera, like that. I don't have access to big, funny machines and lymphangiosyntigraphies, and I can't even request those things. And so lucky for me, is that lipedema and lymphedema are both things that we're able to look at um, subjectively and look at your health history and look at the symptoms that you're providing. And most of the time, we can get a pretty good idea of which condition you fall under. Um, but to be officially diagnosed, if uh, you have lipedema or lymphedema, you will know the fun that it is to go and get officially diagnosed. So we are recording this this evening, so that we can go on the Alberta Lymphedema Association's YouTube channel, which I love. Um, but also, if you have any questions, you're more than welcome to put them into the chat, and um, I will make sure that I uh, go through all the questions that you put in there at the very end of the presentation, a little bit easier for me, instead of trying to follow the chat at the same time. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to talk about the differences. So the first thing, just really basic, simple um, and I'm always, you know, when patients first come in and we're doing the initial intake, I always say, you know, how much do you actually know about your lymphatic system? And I love that we have the access to Google and all of those beautiful systems. However, they can be misleading at times. So we always do a really basic 
intro. And if you ever heard me do this, you'll hear some of the same words because they're my favorites. So uh, your circulatory system is your heart, your arteries, your veins, and your heart pumps out beautiful nutrients, water, um, you know, oxygen, food, all types of hormones, everything, and circulates it to every cell in your body. So there's very few tissues in your body that are not vascularized, which means that they have blood supply. So things like the cornea of your eye, the lens of your eye, the top layer of your skin, which is called the epidermis, it doesn't have blood supply, the cartilage in your joints, um, the elastic cartilage, like in your ear, in your nose, between your discs, um, the cartilage itself doesn't have blood supply, but the tissue around it does. So there's certain areas that just don't have blood supply, but otherwise your heart pumps out oxygen, nutrients, water to all of the tissues, your organs, your tongue, your teeth, your lips, your ears, your muscles, your nerves, your bones, all of those tissues need blood. And when those tissues get the oxygen, the nutrients and the water, they give off waste products. And those waste products, we were told way back when, and when I say way back when, I mean before 2009, we were told that the majority of all those waste products, like 92 to 98%, we were told was picked up by your venous system and carried back to your heart. Well, in 2009, 2010, there was a study that actually went in and said, you know what, we've actually been mis, uh, you know, interpreting this information and now they're saying that 99.9, .9, I want to say it's 0.998 or something percent of all the waste products that your tissues create. And I mean, all of your tissues. So all the muscles, all the bones, all the joints, all the tendons, all of those things actually gets picked up by your lymphatic system. So your lymphatic system, I describe to most of my patients as being like a big water, water vacuum, big hydro vac. And it clears all the fluid that's found in your tissues and it takes it to lymph nodes, little water treatment plants where you have lots of your immune cells living inside your nodes and they attack and look at foreign pathogens and bad you know, viruses, bacteria, et cetera, and destroys and attacks on your behalf. Once that lymphatic fluid that had all the waste products, et cetera, that your body didn't need excess water. Um, recovered hormones. Everybody has some cancer cells in them. So all those kinds of cells as well. After it's been put through several lymph nodes, and I mean, if we say generalized, your whole body has about 800 lymph nodes, it goes through all of these different beautiful lymph nodes and eventually gets put back into your venous system right at the very base of your neck. Okay. So if you feel your collarbone and you go all the way to the midline of it, there's that nice little bump before you get to the exact midline. That's called your sternoclavicular joint. And right behind there is where your lymph system goes back into your vein. And then your vein takes it to your heart. Your heart pumps it around your body. And you get rid of the excess wastes, the excess water, the excess things that you don't need. Majority of it is going to leave your body by then filtering to your kidneys, which then goes to create urine. You pee it out. So you can also sweat it out. You can also exhale it out through your breath. Um, you can get rid of some of the waste products through your fecal matter, you know, all the really good processes of elimination. So that's kind of like a really basic of how your lymphatic system works. So once we understand that, we have something called edema, okay? Edema just means excess fluid that's found in your tissue spaces. So a general edema is meaning that generally the cause comes from somewhere else. So somebody who has liver failure, heart failure, kidney failure, um, pregnancy, um, somebody who's taking like medications and both their legs are starting to swell up. Those are all general edemas. So it's like the whole body is affected. You see it equally on both sides. Somebody who has kidney failure, they'll have both their legs starting to swell you have heart failure, you're going to start seeing, depending on which side of the heart, you could see uh, fluid buildup in the lungs or fluid found in other areas around your body. That is a general edema. Okay. So edema just means fluid accumulation in the tissues. We also have local edema. Local edema means that it's normally one-sided. And if both sides are affected, it's going to be one side's worse. So a general edema on the left-hand side of your screen, that is saying that it's normally 
both sides of the body and it's equal. It looks like the same on both sides, right? So if my husband goes outside and there's lots of um, pollen in the air, both of his eyes swell up, okay? Or if um, we look at somebody who's pregnant, normally both of their legs swell up. They have cankles or they have sausage toes or they have sausage fingers, both sides kind of equal. A local edema means that there's local trauma in that vicinity, that small area. So if you've done a sprain to your ankle, or if you fractured a bone, um, you've had surgery, um, a biopsy, cancers, it creates local edema. Um, if you get a bee sting, that's a local allergy. Uh, maybe you have an infection from a paper cut that got infected. That's a local edema. So a little bit of swelling that's happening in the area. Venous problems traditionally they're going to show up more on one side versus the other. You can have them, you know, kind of running through both legs or both arms. That's fine. Um, and lymphedema is a type of local edema, which sounds weird because a lot of times we go, no, no, like I've got swelling in both legs. But when we have a lymphedema, generally there's one limb that is worse than the other. So it still is technically considered a lymphedema as a local edema. So a lymphedema is damage to the lymphatic system, which is causing swelling. Okay, so there's a difference between edema and lymphedema. And so a lot of times we'll have people come in and it's just because the words get thrown around a lot. It's not a big issue. I know what you're talking about, um, but in case it's something that you've been you know, trying to clarify in your head, Edema is just fluid that's accumulated in your tissue. A lymphedema is fluid that's accumulated in tissue because of lymphatic damage or overtaxation. Um, and normally that fluid's not just fluid, it's also got a lot of proteins in it. So it's protein rich. Okay. So <clears throat> these are different presentations of how we see. So general edema, if you have cardiovascular or kidney failure. Malnutrition, um, you know, I used to always think, well, that's obviously they're doing fine. Look at them. They have a big fat belly. Well, you know, that's, you know, the ignorance of, of youth. Um, but that's actually a lot of fluid that's accumulated into the abdomen because of proteins and not like food proteins, but plasma proteins from your blood that have leaked into the tissues. So that's ascites. Um, as well as um, what we're looking at. Um, the medication in that picture, um, bound center of the screen, it says figure one, that is bilateral petting edema due to gabapentin. So that is a medication-induced generalized edema. So presentation is symmetrical, it's bilateral. Okay, whereas we look at a local edema, normally it's unilateral, means one side, but can be both sides. But when it is, it's asymmetrical. So um, nice lip injection reaction happening there. Um, that picture, that's my daughter and I, when she was little, she had her first big anaphylaxis to consuming yogurt and her cute little face turned into a little puff ball of um, local edema. Um, so obviously um, any kind of allergic reaction is, depends on where it is, but you know, her whole face was cutely affected that way. Um, broken bones, um, venous issues like varicosities, but that's chronic venous insufficiency. And that picture on the bottom right, that is lymphedema. So like I said, it is common that we see both lower extremities or both arms or the whole head and neck. But again, one side typically will be worse than the other. <clears throat> All right, so let's look at lymphedema first to make sure we understand lymphedema, which I'm sure most people are, but this is always good. So when we look at lymphedema, we have primary and secondary. Secondary kind of gets like the limelight. It gets the spotlights of Hollywood when we look at it because secondary is easier to explain. Secondary, you know, people are like, oh, it was cancer. Or, oh, it was radiation. Oh, it was an excision of a node. Or, you know, they, we know exactly what caused it. We know the lymphatic system is damaged. Um, and from that, we have swelling that can happen at any time after that damage. It could be minutes, it could be days, it could be weeks, it could be years, it could be decades. Um, and so that's secondary. Secondary is we know the cause, but your system was intact when you were born. So there's a secondary reason why you developed lymphedema. Primary, a lot of people do not know about primary. And when I did all my training, they said, oh, 
you know, primary, there's not that many, you won't see it. And it became like the number one thing I saw in my practice. And it's because it's, it's under serviced as, as a, as a population. And so primary, there's a genetic or even a potentially unknown cause. We don't know why. And I had a great pleasure of attending the Banff lymphatic forum that happened back here in June. And, you know, there's, there's studies that they're doing about, you know, are you genetically predisposed to not being able to move the same amount of fluid? Why if, you know, Susie Q, you know, has two lymph nodes removed in her left armpit, does she not create any lymphedema swelling? But then, you know, Betty C has the same two lymph nodes in the same armpit removed and she swells instantaneously. And they're actually noticing that there is a genetic predisposition that some people will start to have lymphatic failure or more inflammation, just unfortunately draw the genetic, you know, crap card on that one. So there's some really amazing research that they're going into as to why it happens, but primary, you're just, you're kind of born with it. And either you know about it like right away because you see swelling at birth or, you know, in the first couple of years, or maybe you don't notice swelling until your teenage years. Um, or maybe it's not until after you hit 35. So we, we can look at it and say, okay, you know, we, we say you're canadal or congenital or Milroy's that's when you're born with the lymphedema, we can see the lymph swelling. So if you ever see pictures of kids, babies wearing compression garments, all that fun. That is canadal or Milroy's. Praycox is like in the teenage years. Um, I always love that when people come in, they're like, ah, I just, I've always had one big leg since I was a teenager. And my mom's always had one big leg. And it's, it always makes me giggle a little bit because they just assume it's completely normal. They're just one big legged kind of girls. And I'm like, that's not a normal thing, but maybe in your family it is. So let's look at primary lymphedema. And then uh, lymphedema tartum is over the age of 35. And so, you know, there's a lot of ways that these sort of work together and it's a lot of questions. And if you've ever um, done a full lymphedema intake with a lymphedema therapist, we ask a lot of questions and we seem extremely nosy, um, but it's because I really care and I want to know what's causing things and why did it start and what are your triggers and what are the things that make it worse and how are you a unique, as we say in our clinic, a unique lymphy corn and how do we make your life that much better? So um, there's that primary lymphedema. So, you know, we don't see lots and lots and lots of babies being born swollen. So congenital, it's only like 2%. Um, you know, if we look at lymphedema precox, that's the highest incidence at 75 to 85%. Lymphedema tartum, um, generally as you get older, your veins get weaker. That's a natural progression of life. Your immune system gets weaker. Um, so if you had a compromised lymphatic system and you didn't know it, it can show up after the age of 35 spontaneously, something that causes a trigger, et cetera. So, so many different causes. Um, and the, the things that we, we look at, um, sometimes is very easy to find. And sometimes it's, it's a confusion. And sometimes it's like that one, that one straw that pushed you over the edge, that broke the camel's back, that tipped the scales of your fluid balance. And, um, that's where we see things. So disease surgery, obviously surgery is the number one cause of lymphedema in North America. Um, if I look globally, it's actually that cute little parasite that's not so cute, um, creating an infection and uh, obstruction within your lymphatic system, that's filariasis. Um, but we are seeing more and more, especially in North America, the obesity related lymphedema, um, malignant tubers, obviously radiography um, or radiotherapy, sorry. Um, trauma, there are a lot of potential reasons that we see lymphedema. So a lot of times, you know, we've all seen this, but there's different stages of lymphedema. So um, on this slide, it says one, two, three, four. Um, in uh, a lot of times in Canada, we'll say actually stage zero, one, two, three. So the first stage there on the far left, you have a compromised lymphatic system, but there's no current swelling. So, you know, 
a lot of people say, well, I don't have lymphedema because I don't have swelling. And I do understand that component. But if I take it down to the anatomical level, you do have fluid retention. You just can't see it yet. So stage zero, it's like there's abnormal flow, but you don't have a lot of fluid backup. But this is like that beautiful stage of we just got to keep things happy and balanced so that way it doesn't go over the edge. And so I love that first stage. We call it stage zero in our clinic. Um, and these are the types of clients I want to see every single day. I want to see people before swelling really starts and make sure that it doesn't happen and that we can keep things preventative, getting compression garments preventatively, um, maybe using a pneumatic compression pump preventatively, um, starting to do some exercises while wearing garments, you know, to prevent a fluid accumulation. That's my state favorite stage stage that very first one stage zero is what we call it um so different places around the world will name the stages but it's not a big deal um in my book stage one which is stage two on your screen this is when we start to get that accumulation of fluid but it can go away overnight if you are keeping your legs you know horizontal and everything's good and you're not fighting gravity you elevate your legs it gets better it goes away and you're like must have just been a bad day um, that can happen, but the more times that this goes back and forth, back and forth, it's like your body saying, look, I can't handle this. You pushed me to my limit. Now I have swelling. Dude, don't do that again. And unfortunately in our brain, we go, oh, I recovered from that swelling. Everything's fine. And then we go on with our lives and we forget and we forget and we go, oh no, I can go out to the beach and sunbathe and have fun in the sun. And uh, I can do stampede for like 11 hours in cowboy boots that I only wear once a year and drink alcohol and all the salty foods that have been <laughs> deep fried and all that good. And I'm going to do a whole bunch of uh, rides. And then I'm going to fly with my family back to Toronto and not think a second thing about it. So the more that that second stage, stage two on your screen happens, your body goes, look, I can't, I've been trying to tell you this whole time. It's not really working for me and I can't recover because you just keep pushing me to my limits. And then all of a sudden we hit that third stage. So stage three on the screen, stage two in my books. Um, this is now where you have swelling that we can't ever fully relieve. I can bring it down, but I can't fully relieve it because there's also going to be skin changes. And then stage four, that's lymphostatic elephantiasis. In my books, that's stage three. That is the, now the limb itself has started to change enough that not only is the skin getting thicker because it's trying to save you, it's trying to actually prevent you from swelling even further. It's trying to create a nice thick skin so it can't stretch anymore. But you also might get some nice little, um, almost like blisters and the lymph might be like, look, I can't get out through the normal pathway. So I'm just gonna go straight out through the skin. Um, you can start getting a lot of like nerve damage, irritation, all those things. So lymphedema in all its glory, if I could just hang out with everybody in stage zero and stage one, which are the first two here, um, that would be phenomenal. But having said that, because most people um, either haven't heard about lymphedema, don't really understand it, were not referred. Unfortunately, I don't see people until they get to the stage two. And heaven forbid, but a lot of times when they live very far away, they live in a farm, they live farther away from centers, I won't see them until they're in elephantiasis. And uh, that's kind of a heartbreaking thing. So that's why um, I've joined the ALA. That's why I'm a director on the ALA. That's why I teach around the world, because I think if you can catch everybody in these first two stages, like seriously, what a greater place this would be. And so... Oh my goodness. And then it went and said, that's all far as we're going to go. And I don't know why. So give me one second and I'm going to pull it back up because I don't know why it's doing that to me. So please give me one second. See, now it's acting all kind of weird. Aha. Okay. I did find it. So give me one second here. Such, um, I love technical problems. <laughs> you know what? If it doesn't happen once, what's the point? Right? Like, you just got to go. 
you just got to go and have fun with it. And if you don't like, it's just, you know, it's more exciting that way. Yeah. Right. Or is it just me? No, it is. It, huh. makes, it, it makes you go all of a sudden. Oh, I have yeah. to pay attention now. It's like, well, and of course you do the very best you can. And the next thing you know, it shows up and you're like, all right, then yeah. never mind. There you go. All right. So this is where, this is where we were. We were looking at these four stages. It's because I had two versions of this awesome PowerPoint and I evolved one and I just, I didn't stay long enough with it. I apologize. All right. So one of the things that we don't look at often is um, the correlation between obesity and lymphedema. And so obesity, because of the added amount of fat molecules, because of the pressure on the lymphatics, um, you know, because lymphedema is a progressive enlargement of the tissue um, due to inadequate lymphatic function, we can see that once you start having your BMI hit over 50, we notice that an obesity induced lymphedema for the lower extremities can occur. So anything over 50, we start seeing that there's more pooling back into the legs here. The dye hasn't even left. So this is where they're injecting that dye. This is a lymphangiosyntigraphy. They inject that dye and here's somebody, they have, you know, a weakened system, but there's still some lymphatics. It's getting up to the nodes in the groin. Here we are at BMI 45. Yes, we're still seeing it getting up to the groin, but look what happens once you get closer to 50. There's the dye. It slowly makes it up one side, but it's not moving on the other. And once we hit over 50, the dye's here. You can't really see it through the legs. Yes, it gets picked up in the groin, but here we're starting to see, look, it's just pooling. It's not moving past the ankles, maybe getting a little bit into the knee. Yeah, sure. There's a little bit, but notice how this side is the least inflamed or the least congested, right? So on this individual, their left leg is worse. And then look at the BMI over 64, the fluid, the lymph dye that they inject is staying into the ankles. So um, there's been a lot of research looking at BMI over 50. Um, there's lymphangiosyntigraphies where they can show impaired lymphatic damage um, for both the lower extremities. And I will say too, is individuals who have quite a bit of weight around their abdomen, you can get fluid retention in the tissues of the abdominal skin. And so that in itself can be extremely difficult um, to then reduce as well. So um, patients at risk for obesity induced lymphedema, um, they should be you know, working with their um, bariatric team if they have one. Um, but definitely um, a lot of times when you see people who are quite overweight, there is a large fluid component. So when I do watch reality shows, which is not often, but if I do, um, the ones about individuals who have a very high body weight um, are extremely interesting to watch. And if you watch, a lot of it has lymphedema as either a secondary piece, normally to the obesity, or an undiagnosed first component. So they had trauma at one point or in their family, they might have primary lymphedema that never was diagnosed. And then all of a sudden you just see it and you can tell, you can see it within the feet, the legs, there's a difference between just obesity and obesity with lymphedema. So we do see, unfortunately, our fair share of this here, even in Calgary. Um, and it, it's really hard to manage because of course the weight doesn't make it easier to do exercise or movement, but the fluid makes it heavier. And so it's a very catch 22 situation. So this is kind of how it works is that the obesity that is happening within, um, their body leads to a compromised, um, microcirculation. So the, the circulation that happens around the cells, the individual tissue cells, um, will become more pronounced, then they're going to get inflammation, fibrosis, which is the hardening of the tissues, which makes it harder to move that fluid, hypoxia, which is low oxygen, um, and that will result in compromised lymphatics. Now your lymphatic system is having a harder time moving the fluid, which means now that lymph that is trying to get vacuumed out and pulled from all of your tissues to go to lymph nodes can't, so the lymph just stays like puddles all around your body. 
And then your body goes, there's this amazing um, research article and I can never remember um, when it was, but it actually showed that the more fatty tissue, the more fat cells that you have within your body in an area, the lymphatic fluid will slow down. And so they had a correlation between fatty deposits and lymphatic movement. So they basically came to the conclusion that the more fat cells, the slower the lymph, the slower the lymph, the more your body puts down fat cells. But if you can increase the lymphatic fluid movement, your body will start to break down fat. And we store a lot of toxins, a lot of waste products in our fat as well. So then you need to have a strong lymph system to then move those toxins, those things that are found in your fat cells. And so the more lymphatic, the healthier the lymph movement, the less fat cells you have in that area. So it's kind of, again, it's that weird catch 22. And if you can catch it early, right? So lymph stasis will then create more fat accumulation, which then causes an increased lymphatic stasis. So you end up having more fluid that accumulates and then it just get bigger and more fat cell. It's this horrible system of play in the game. So we can see obesity and lymphedema without lipedema. Okay. So there is that difference. When we treat lymphedema, we have two stages. We work in the decongestion phase and we have a maintenance phase. So the decongestion phase is that blue circle. And that's where, you know, you're seeing a lymphedema therapist. They're doing lymphatic drainage. You're getting um, short stretch bandage or compression bandage or reduction kits to help push the fluid out of the limb and help uh, mobilize the fluid and keep it moving in the right direction or rerouting, whatever your body kind of needs. Um, you do exercise. We make sure your skin is super happy and healthy. You don't have any wounds. You're not getting skin infections. Your toes are looking really good. There's no fungus, all those things. And so phase one is how do we get your limb down to the size we want it to? Okay. Once we establish that, then we're in a game of maintenance. So how do we keep it there? So instead of using reduction kits or short stretch bandages, bandaging, we use compression garments. We say, okay, your limb is as big as we want or as small as we can get it. Let's keep it here. Let's create a new garment that is like brand new skin for you and get it fitted properly. And you're going to wear that. We're still doing lymph drainage. We're still doing skin care. We're still doing exercises, but probably not as often. You don't have to see my cute little face as often. Um, you're able to do a lot of it at home. Maybe you're using a pneumatic compression pump. Maybe you're using lymphatic taping. Maybe you use an amazing little rebounder. Maybe you go swimming all the time. There's lots of ways we can keep you in that maintenance phase. But we can always slingshot back and have to do the decongestion phase again. So if you decide that you're going to take an airplane ride and forget your compression, you decide that, yes, it's plus 32, but the wedding dress that you got to go and attend this person's wedding just won't look good if you have a compression garment on. So screw it for the day. Um, I decide that I'm going to go and climb a mountain, but I don't want to wear my compression. All of those situations, if it swells to a point where we have to do the reduction piece again, then we go back into phase one. So it kind of, you know, this is, you know, most of the time I'd love it if I could just do the decongestion phase once, get you into the maintenance phase, and then we just keep you there for the rest of your life. So let's just all aim for that and we'll be happy. So how is lipedema different? Um, there's a lot of things. If, even if you just look at the picture for a second, and this is a very blatantly obvious uh, photo depiction of the difference between lymphedema and lipedema. But if we look at it, we said lymphedema generally is one-sided. Now you can have it both legs, but it tends to have a very smooth appearance. It tends to be quite swollen. Um, whereas lymphedema most of the time has a very um, obese, obesity, fat component where you're looking at cellulite, et cetera. It's pretty equal bilaterally. But that's just the very, very basics. Not everybody looks like this with lipedema. Having said that though, in our practice, I'm pretty sure I could start a lipedema calendar and have easily three years worth of lipedema calendar girls um, who look almost exactly like the images, but they've been misdiagnosed for years. So I'm, I'm more on the fence of just individuals or not, and doctors and medical professionals aren't educated to understand what is lipedema. So 
All right. So lipedema, major identifiers. So this is the thing. If you come in, most of the time, we're going to, we're going to start from here, go down. So they have a small waist. Okay. doesn't mean like itty bitty, but the big thing is between the waist and the widest part of the hips is very disproportionate. So you can have somebody who is quite thin or quite small and you can still see it. It's almost like their hips are like significant. And I, I mean, like without plastic surgery, like not Kardashian kind of crap, but I mean like normal average Joe's at the grocery store. And you're like, that's a small waist. And those are some wide hips. Okay. That's the first kind of indicator. And a lot of times it's not the circumference. It's the, the distance between both sides. So we kind of use like the caliper idea where you're sort of going on the width that way. Um, from the hips down to the ankles, it's very balanced both sides. It looks like there's a lot of fatty tissue. It'll look like cellulite. Um, you might actually get some pretty pronounced nodules or what they call marbles on here. Um, you can notice quite a bit of mottled coloration to the skin. Um, it looks very uneven. Individuals with lipedema will also most of the time, not always, I've seen exceptions to this, explain that their legs are extremely painful and they bruise really easily. Now I've seen this with lip, lymphedema as well, but if I go into somebody's leg with lymphedema and I were to squeeze their skin a little bit, they won't jump and slap my hand away and shout at me, <laughs> but lipedema is quite sensitive. Like their, their, um, cutaneous nerves, their nerves for their skin are really sensitive. Um, the other interesting piece is that if I go back to this slide here, the foot is involved a lot of the times with lymphedema if it's the lower limb, whereas somebody with lip edema can wear normal shoes and both their shoes can be the same size, which does not happen all the time with lymphedema. So they'll get this almost cuffing that occurs down at the ankles. Um, I call them a harem pant cuffing. Um, it kind of looks like Jasmine from Aladdin and their feet and their hands are generally completely not affected. So um, there's the test where we go and pinch the skin between the first and second toe. It's called stemmers sign. And if you have lymphedema, generally I cannot pick up that skin. So we call that a positive stemmer sign where somebody with lipedema, you can pick it up. Their feet are totally fine most of the time. Um, like I said, they can wear regular shoes. Um, yeah, now we can see it also in the upper arms. You can also see it on the sides of the breast tissue. So you can get quite a bit of fat deposits, um, on the sides of the chest and in the upper arms. So, and if you do, you'll get sort of cuffing that can occur at the wrists and even at the elbows, you can see a little bit of a cuffing situation. So with lip edema, we can see what they call bat wings, which I, I really don't like that phrase, but anyways, the fat on the triceps area, the upper arm. Okay. Um, the ankles, the calves, the buttocks, absolutely. Um, it sort of looks like, um, like they have like a shelf or it looks like they just have this amazingly wide hips. And then it goes up to almost like a normal waist. Um, and then on the sides of the hips, the saddlebags are quite pronounced. So there's quite a difference that way. And we can break down lipedema into where you accumulate fat. So the most common ones that I see in practice here in Calgary, type one, type two, type three are the most common. If someone has um, type four, that does happen. And we're starting to see more patients coming forward with um, the type four combinations. So then you're looking at either one of these common um, combination types. Type five, I haven't had a pleasure of working tons with. Um, and so we don't see that lots, but these type two and type three are the top ones that we see. So these are the types of lipedema, but then just like lymphedema, they have stages. So you can have, I'm gonna go back one slide here. You can have type two, stage one, or type three, stage two. So we look at where does the fat accumulate? And then what is the extent of the uh, fat accumulation? But the trick with this is it's not just fat. Remember we talked about the more fat cells you have, the slower your lymph becomes. 
And so what we notice is that the amount of fluid retention that goes with lipedema increases as well, the worse it gets. So this is stage one, okay? There's the fat accumulation along the sides of the hips. There's not a huge difference between the waist and the width, but there is. That's a little bit bigger than I would expect. Same thing here, the waist, and then look at the width of the hips, okay? A lot of times we look at patients and we say, you know, if I were to take a picture of you from the waist up, I wouldn't consider you to be fat. You know, if I had to make a judgment call, which I hate, but if I look from your waist down, you can see there's a very big difference and they don't know exactly why this is. There's a huge component of hereditary. There's a hormonal factor, um, but it's not something you can control and it's not just diet. You cannot just cut out you know, sugars. And I say this a lot, but I have lymph lipedema patients who show up who've been on salads and like raw uh, fruits and vegetables for years. They go to the gym. They might even have something like stage three and they're on a treadmill. They're doing the elliptical. They're in water exercises and their doctors just told them they're fat and they have to reduce that. And they lose weight in their upper body. And this is the thing, they actually lose weight in the upper body, but their lower body cannot lose that weight. Um, and it, they've actually done a lot of research and they've shown that it's not typical fat either. It's a different kind of fat. So if we look at, you know, someone without lipedema, we would say that they have like a yellow fat. Somebody with lipedema has what they call gray fat. So it's actually a different type of fat component and you cannot just exercise it off. It doesn't work. So if we're looking at here, um, we have this lower sort of upper arm that's actually like sagging below the elbow. There's the beautiful increased upper um, component. Um, you can get Achilles involved. Um, that's the back of the ankle. There's that cuff. But here's somebody with no cuff, um, but you can see the fluid and everything, the, the weight of it higher up along the knee. And so it is, it's a very different condition and it's a hard one to, to deal with because it's not as easy. To be honest, lymphedema is a lot easier to treat. Um, the treatment plan is actually very similar between lipedema and lymphedema, but with lymphedema, I'm generally working with fluid. The proteins, yes, an unsupported lymph system, we do rerouting and all that kind of stuff, but there's not this hereditary or predisposition to just place fat in areas around the body. And that's what makes it difficult is that I'm fighting against a lot of different things and hormones are a huge component of it. So there is a treatment um, that's called um, a lymphatic Oh, geez, I lost that. I think it's lymphatic saving liposuction. There's another word for it. Um, but this is basically where they go in, they remove the lipedema fat. So it doesn't remove all fat. It removes the lipedema fat. And they do it with almost like a water jet. It looks like, you know, those hoses that you use at the car wash, um, but much smaller, obviously. And they go in and it helps take the fat out by liposuction, but it doesn't damage the lymphatics. Traditional liposuction causes so much damage to the lymphatics. Um, I have had patients who have done it um, against um, advice, and we end up seeing a lot of pain. We end up seeing um, a lot of uh, lymphedema created by liposuction. And so, yes, you took the fat out, but now the lymphatics are damaged even further and are unable to um, deal with that. So the lymphatic saving liposuction um, doesn't happen a lot here in Canada, more the US, definitely in Europe. So when we look at lipedema and how it works, first off, your job is always to try and help manage pain, help with um, getting their body moving, et cetera. So we do lymph drainage therapy. We do the hands-on therapy. We do reduction kits like circades or ferro wraps or we can do short stretch bandage. It tends to be too sensitive and they don't enjoy it. Um, they're more sensitive to compression garments than a lymphedema patient most of the time. Um, there's not tons of support. 
Um, in Alberta, there is the Alberta Lipedema Association, which I'm very proud to know that there have been some new members who are sort of going to be like taking it over and making it better. Um, and uh, very, very excited that they're starting to get a little bit more movement because it's the advocacy that we're very lucky in Alberta that we have the ALA that gives you a lot of resources and talks like this that help you understand what's going on in the body. Whereas lipedema, you're really you're you're looking at a lot of um, random YouTube videos of personal experiences, which is beneficial, but doesn't help you necessarily understand. So, you know, with somebody with lipedema, we do the garments, we give them the exercises to do, we are educating them on how to do self-care for themselves. Sometimes they can use a pneumatic compression pump. Sometimes it's too uncomfortable. They don't enjoy it. Um, sometimes they need to work with certain medications to help manage that, or they need to be referred out to um, potentially a, a liposuction specialist who works with lipedema. And I'm very happy to see that there are more becoming available. Doesn't mean that it's the answer for everyone. It is normally not a one surgery fixes all. It is normally uh, one surgery and recovery and then three more surgeries in the same year and then potentially afterwards. And you still wear compression garments for the rest of your life. So it's not a fix. Um, we do notice, same thing with lymphedema is that diet can have an impact, but it's very individualized. So if you are an individual who eats, let's say nightshade vegetables, onions, garlic, um, peppers, and you get bloated, that's your body saying, I don't do well with this. And look, I can be increasing the amount of inflammation you have by eating those. Obviously those are good things to cut out. What they've noticed with lipedema is that if you reduce the amount of sugar components, and that even means like long chain carbohydrates, breads, sugars, et cetera, your body is um, able to start, you know, breaking down the excess fats that you have, not necessarily the gray fat, but the yellow fat that's within the body. And they notice that with paleo, um, anti-inflammatory diets, and for the life of me, the RAD diet is completely blanking on me, but we do notice that that can help. So when patients come and see me and they have lymphedema and they go, what's the diet that's going to fix my lymphedema? I say, well, what does your body not do well on? Like if you eat potatoes and you're bloated, can we stay away from potatoes? Because your lymph system's already having a hard time processing the foods that, you know, the fluid that you have, if you're eating foods that are going to make you create more inflammation, you're just, you're making this much harder on yourself, right? So lots of really um, different ways to look at it. Um, I've yet to find any like research article that says one diet works for everyone, but makes sense. So big differences here between lipedema and lymphedema. So the definition lipedema, it's a chronic disorder of fat metabolism causes disproportionate amounts of fats stored in the lower half of the body. Traditionally, it can happen in the arms, understandably. Um, whereas lymphedema is a chronic disorder, excess fluid buildup, arms, lower legs. We know it can be in the head, face, neck, um, belly, breast tissue. It can be anywhere and everywhere, right? We know that it can be um, from injury or it can be genetic. Uh, affecting males or females, lipedema. I've only ever seen one official case of diagnosed male lipedema, but it, it can happen. So um, lymphedema, we know it affects both males and females. There's no uh, favoritism there. The disorder of the lymphatic system. Lipedema actually is not a disorder of the lymphatic system. It's how the lymph has to move around the fat adipose cells. Whereas lymphedema, we know, is because of lymphatic dis dysfunction or destruction or overtaxation. So Lipedema, it says the only thing is hormones, but there's a genetic factor. We also know lipedema tends to get worse with hormone fluctuations. So in adolescence, um, if we look at pregnancies, even menopause can cause lipedema to get worse. Um, if we look at lymphedema, it can be genetic. It could be cancer, surgery, radiation, um, injury, incident, infection, parasite, like so many things. Uh, starting region of the legs, normally we see lymphedema in the upper legs. If you're going to get lymphedema in your legs, a lot of the time it'll start in the feet and the lower legs, not always, but 
it'll look very different. Um, like I said, somebody with lipedema will look like cellulite, sort of have that what we call peau d'orange, which is like um, orange skin, orange peel. Okay, it has that sort of rough look, cottage cheese look. Lip, uh, lymphedema, unless it's associated with um, obesity, we don't tend to see that. It tends to be tighter, smoother, um, obviously tight, you know, tight skin on lymphedema is not ideal. So um, usually affected part of the body. So for lipedema, it's going to be a lot of its lower legs they, from the waist down. And this is, if you, if you haven't seen a lot of lipedema, start looking when you're at the grocery store, look at the people in line around you, look at the people that look like they're just, you know, 10 years ago, you might've said, man, they really let themselves go like, oh my goodness, that is some big hips. Like, how do they not know? And they do trust me, they 100% know, but it may not be something that they have control over. So um, I'm one of those awkward people that, you know, in the middle of a grocery store, I'll be like, so how long have you had lymphedema? I have, because to me, a lot of people don't understand and don't know. And so if it can be something that leads them to just going and doing some research and not feeling like they're an ultimate failure at keeping their body going, I'm willing to have the awkwardness in the conversation. Uh, new advanced treatments. So when we look at lip edema, effectively treated with lymphatic sparing, not saving, sparing, um, liposuction surgery. Um, when we look at lymphedema, they're talking about um, different kinds of, uh, we all know just from looking at lymphedema, this is obviously from a research article, but we know that there's, you know, lymph node transfers. We know there's lymphovenous surgeries. Um, looking at medications. If you were able to listen to Dr. Stanley Roxon's presentation back in April, there are so many ways that lymphedema and even just attending the conference that I did, I know Diane attended a, an amazing conference as well. There's so many progresses that we're seeing with lymphedema. Um, and I really do think that lymphedema is, is going to be getting there with um, acknowledgement and awareness. And hopefully we'll start seeing that happen as well. So so this is the name of my clinic. If you ever want to go check it out, or if you want to send um, an email, my email address is Robin, R-O-B-I-N at lymphbalance.com. Um, but if you ever have questions or if there's anything from the presentation that you're like, hey, I need to ask that question because I just wanted to know a little bit more, you're more than welcome to reach out. Um, and yeah, and if you have any questions, feel free to either you know pop it in the chat. I don't see anything that happened in the chat which either means I spoke extremely fast and, or I explained everything so well that you're like, I want her to just stop. 